happens in a read operation is so first there are these capacitances cpl bar and cpl first thing what we do is we precharge this bit line and bit line bar to vdd this is the first thing that we do so these both terminals are precharged to vdd respectively then what we do is we apply or assert the word line high how we do that we basically apply a pulse to this uh, like wl and the amplitude of this pulse is kind of vdd plus vth of this access transistor so that these access transistors can pass the entire vdd if you know nmos cannot pass perfect vdd if you apply only vdd to its gate terminal so if this is vdd and this is vdd what nmos will pass is vdd minus vth so just to remove this problem we actually apply a vdd plus vth of access to this word line now once that is done let us say that our sm cell was storing q equals to 1 and q bar equals to 0 so what happens is the moment you actually turn on your word lines you turn on your m5 and m6 access transistors here there won't be any problem on the right hand side because this node was already at vdd and this is also at vdd but on the other hand on the left hand side if you look closely what happens is this this let's say m5 and this is let's say m1 so this terminal is q bar which we call let's say q bar this is vdd this is vdd plus vthn and this is vdd so this m1 is on m1 will try to drain this load capacitor towards ground while this vdd will try to like so m1 will try to pull this node potential vq bar towards ground so m1 tries to pull this node potential vq bar towards ground while this m5 because it is connected to this vdd will try to pull it towards vdd so for this vq bar m1 tries to pull it down by your m5 tries to pull it to vdd so the final voltage of vq bar will depend upon relative strengths of m1 and m5 now what you exactly want is since you are just reading this device what you want is the state of device should not change now when the state of this bistable element changes so if we have this bistable element like this so this m5 is kind of you know applying let's say this is m5 this was zero this is one this is again zero and you are applying a vdd over here and m5 is on so this is trying to pull this node towards a potential let's say vq bar now when does this kind of uh, trigger or overpower this pi stable element and switch it when does that uh, when does this happen so as i told that when you apply this vdd for a time period which is kind of more than two times tp where tp is kind of the inverter delay it will force it and it will change the state of this now we don't want that right because we are reading the device and we don't want the state of the device to change so what should we do so let us look at this bistable element characteristics again let us say we are kind of applying a voltage vx over here which is kind of coming from your access transistor and the state of this inverter is like this 0 1 and 0 let us look at the butterfly curve for this bistable element Let's say this is inverter one. This is inverter two. So first we have drawn inverter one characteristics, and then we have drawn inverter two characteristics. 
let's say this is our butterfly curve for this pi stable element. Now this is let's say v of in one and this is let's say v of out one. Now what we are doing is apparently we are applying this vx to this input, right? This is let's say our vm and we have another critical point which is vth of this n. So we have these two critical elements. So as I told that if you are at this state A, which is this case, I mean you were initially at state A and now we start to apply something, a voltage which is Vx. So what happens is we start from this state A and we apply some voltage, which is kind of Vx. So as long as we do not hit this C, which is Vm, we are sure that even if the input is here, let's say even if your Vx is here, we will again come back because of this generative regenerative feedback, we will come back to this stable state A. However, if somehow your Vx increases to this point, I mean if it increases beyond Vm, somewhere here, definitely you will kind of, you know, uh, sorry, definitely what you will do is you will kind of go towards the state B, which you do not want. So what is the condition on this Vx? It should be less than Vm of inverted to or let's say Vm of this cross coupled inverter pair because what we are assuming is that this Vm is equal for both. Now there is one more constraint which you will find in all these books like Rabe and Veste. So what is given in Rabe and Veste is that your Vx should be less than Vth of n. And why so? Because the moment it becomes more than Vth, here you know it starts to transit from A to C. However, because of this regenerative property, even if it comes close to this C, but it's less than C, like the value of Vx is less than the Vm, it will again you know go back to the state. However, why they take this Vx less than Vthl as the condition? So why they take this as a condition is just to have some margin, just to have some margin. Let's say if I restrict or if I design my cells such that, you know, your Vx is less than VTHL. So my Vx won't increase beyond this point ever. So I have this margin, which is like Vm minus Vx. So if any noise is present in the circuit, which is less than this magnitude of Vm minus Vx. So that can also be tolerated. And we can work even with that kind of noise without affecting the state of this uh, SRAM cell. So that is why just to have this margin, they kind of design or they tell that the design rule is Vx should be less than Vth of n. However, that is not the case. I mean, even if you have this Vx very close to this Vm, but less than Vm, then you will again go back to this state here. And you will have what is called non destructive creed. Now, how do they ensure it? So, as we saw that you had this, this is ground, this is M5, sorry, this is M1, and this is M5, this is your VDD, and this is your node VQ. So the voltage of this node VQ bar depends upon the pull strength of this M1, which is kind of defined by the W by L ratio of 1, to the strength of this M5, which is W by L of 5. This ratio is a very important ratio, which is called the cell ratio CR. And what we ideally want is that the pull strength of this 1 should be higher than pull strength of 2, that is your pull strength of 1 pull strength of M1 should be higher than pull strength of M5 so that this node potential VQ is placed as close to the ground as possible. So we want our VQ bar, the node potential at the VQ bar as low as possible, as close to the ground as possible. So that is the criteria and because of that, what we will have to do, we will have to increase the 
W by L ratio of this one as compared to the W by L ratio of the access transistor. So for 60 SM cells, the first constraint on sizing of your inverters is that your uh, NMOS transistor of inverters should be strong than your access transistors. So that is the first criteria. Now let us look at the right operation. So in right operation, what we do is we still have these bit line capacitances, CBL and CBL bar. So what we do is first we apply VBL and VBL bar according to whatever we want to write. Right condition. So what we do is, let's say this was Q equals to one, this was Q bar equals to zero. And now we want to force, you know, let's write Q equals to zero and Q bar equals to one. Now what we want to write is, Q equals to zero and Q bar equals to one. So what we do is we apply ground here. I mean, so you apply VBL equals to ground and here you apply VBL bar equals to VD. Now, what we do is after this step, we assert word line high to start the right uh, kind of procedure. Again, we apply a pulse and the pulse kind of uh, magnitude is VDD plus VTH of the access transistors as we discussed earlier. Now what happens is, you know, uh, this node tries to force this node towards VDD and this node tries to force this node towards ground. Now the important thing to note here is we have designed our this ratio of M5 and M, M1 such that this node potential VQ bar can't be pulled very high. So what is the constraint that we use for de uh, defining this? We use the constraint that VQ bar should be less than VTHN if we want to have some noise margin. Or in the worst case, it should be less than VM for sure. So your VQ bar cannot go beyond this VM value. So it cannot go to VDD and we cannot force this uh, VD, like we cannot force this VDD over this VQ bar. However, let us look at the right hand side now. Let us look at this portion. So if you look at this portion, what you observe is that you have a circuit like this. You have this PMOS M4, you have this node potential VQ, and you have this M6, which is connected to VDD plus something, which is VTH of access transistor. This is connected to VDD. This is connected to let's say zero. So this, so that this is turned on. And you have this M6 over here, which is connected to your ground. So what happens with this, uh, with this VQ, uh, VQ node? M6 tries to pull it towards ground, while your M4 tries to pull it towards VDD. So what happens in this case is M6 tries to pull it towards ground, M4 tries to pull it towards VDD. However, what we want with VQ? So how VQ is connected? So VQ is kind of connected to this, to the other inverter like this. And we have at this output zero. And what we want is we want to flip this from zero to one. So if we want to flip an inverter from zero to one, what should be the criteria? Our VQ should be less than VM of inverter one. Right? That is the criteria. Does this make sense? So the moment your VQ reaches below this VM inverter of one, it starts to initiate the switching from zero to one. However, if you want to again have the noise margin and all, 
what you need to ensure is your VQ should be less than the VTH of NMOS of this inverter. So when this becomes less than the uh, VTH of this inverter, so the inverter turns like the NMOS turns off, and you know this node can easily like this node can be this node can be easily charged to VT by this like the PMOS here like the access transistor can easily charge it to VT once this NMOS turns off. So this is the case. When you know you require this uh, noise margin, and this is the case which will definitely do this. I mean, which is kind of the uh, necessary criterion is this, I would say, and this is necessary and sufficient. So it's for the case you design or you design your uh, sizing of this M4 and M6 such that. If your VQ is less than VTHM, you'll have enough noise margin to operate as well. So that is how it works. And that is why in your West or Rabbit, you'll find that everywhere in the talk in terms of threshold voltage of the uh, NMOS. Whereas even if you reduce it below the uh, you know switching threshold voltage of your butterfly curve, then also it works perfectly fine. Okay, so here what we want is your VQ should be as low as possible. So we want our VQ to be as low as possible. And how can we make VQ low? So we have to, you know, increase the strength of M6 and reduce the strength of M4. So what we want is the strength of this M4 should be less than the strength of this M6. So this is called pull up ratio or pull ratio. So what we want is the strength of this M4 should be less than strength of this M6. So that M6 is able to, you know, pull this node towards the ground more easily. So now this leads to another constraint. And what is this constraint? So for performing a write, what you want is your strength of PMOS of the inverter used in the SRAM cell should be less than your access transistor strength. Okay. Now with that, let us look at what we really call this read write conflict. So, for read operation, what we want is the strength of the access transistor should be less than the strength of your NMOS device or NMOS transistor used in the inverter. While for write, at the same time, what you want is strength of your access transistor should be higher than the strength of your PMOS used in the inverter. Now how we typically design our CMOS inverters is since you know your mobility of holes in PMOS is kind of less than the mobility of electrons in NMOS. So what we do is we kind of double the size of this PMOS as compared to the size of this NMOS. So we kind of double the width of this PMOS as compared to the NMOS so that we have equal pull strength of NMOS and PMOS. Why we need the equal strength? Just because we want your VM to be located midway at VDD by 2. We have equal TPLH and TPHL and noise margin high equals to noise margin low. And these are maximum only when your VM is in the middle or the transistor VTC is kind of balanced. So at the same time, we want the strength of the access transistor to be less than the strength of NMOS, which is actually equal to the strength of PMOS. And the strength of the access transistor should also be greater than the strength of PMOS, which is actually equal to the strength of NMOS. So this is known as read write or write read conflict. So at the same time, for a good read or non destructive read, you want the strength of your access transistor to be lower than the strength of NMOS. And for a good write or for a good writeability, you want the strength of the access transistor to be, to be greater than the strength of the PMOS. 
So for this, how typically your inverters are designed, or how typically your S60 SRAM cells are designed, you have your strength of PMOS of the inverters as the least, as compared to the strength of the access transistors. Strength of your access transistors and the maximum strength is the strength of your NMOS transistors. So what, what is your take? So your 60 SRAM inverters, are they symmetric? Are their VTCs balanced? Definitely no. At the same time, you want all these transistors to be minimum sized. Why so? To increase the density. So you want all these transistors to be as small as possible. And at the same time, you have to satisfy this constraint. And this kind of is the read write conflict which you observe in your 60s SRAM cells. So, how can we kind of come up with a structure where we avoid this kind of read write conflict? So, people also came up with several different SRAM cells. So, nowadays you can find 60 SRAM cells, apart from 60 SRAM cells, you can find 70 SRAM cells, 80 SRAM cells, 90, 10D. The T count can go up to 15 SRAM cells. So, 15 transistors in single SRAM cell. So each of these architectures have their individual benefits. Some of them have uh, don't have this read write conflict. Some of them don't have this uh, single upset event, like impact of the uh, single upset event and all. Some are radiation hard. Uh, some are having a very high, very high uh, noise margins. So those are some qualities that each of these architecture has. But one should always understand that you know. Uh, even if you are making these 80 transistors or 60, 80 transistors or 90 transistors, or uh, when you are increasing the number of transistors, when you are increasing the number of transistors in you know your SRAM cell, you are reducing the density. So density kind of goes very low because this is one SRAM cell. Is storing one bit, right? And you want as many bits to be accumulated, accumulated in your memory as possible. So the density degrades the moment you go from 60 transistors to like like uh, any of these 80 transistor or 20 transistor or 30 whatever you whatever you have. Okay, so one of these configurations which I'm going to talk about was this 80 SLAM cell which you can see over here. So this is the 80 SRAM cell. The benefit that this 80 SRAM cell has is that here, your read path is decoupled from the write path. So if you look like this, here it's for reading, here it's for writing. At the same time, the read path is kind of decoupled from the cell. I mean, the cell is not kind of connected to the read path. So let us look at the operation. So for operation of any SM cell that you may encounter, 60, 80, 10, 20, whatever it is. For read, what you will do is, you will first recharge your bit line and bit line bar. So some configurations may have a different bit line for read, which is the case over here. So here you can see that you have a different bit line for read, which is RBL, which will also have a capacitor here. So what we do is we first recharge it to VD. And then what we do is we assert the WL high. And look at how the cell is operating. Let us just assume, like we assumed in the previous case, let us also assume here that your Q is equals to one and Q bar equals to zero. And now let us assert the word line high. I mean, this was the read word line. So this configuration 80 has special word line and bit line for read. And it has special 
word line and bit lines for write as well which we'll discuss later so first let us focus on this read word line which we have to assert high and this read bit line which is already pre charged to bd let us say that our cell is pre charged to q equals to 1 now what happens if the cell is speech if the cell is containing 1 it will kind of turn on this transistor right so this transistor over here this is on now once you assert your word line high this transistor also gets on so what it does is it basically discharges this rbl the potential at rbl it basically discharges the potential at rbl to ground so the voltage at this rbl reduces the moment you apply this rwl and you read the cell similarly if your q was zero if your q was zero what would happen is this cell would be turned off and as such whatever value you had at this recharge mode that is vdd will be retained so that way it distinguishes between you know state zero and state one so state zero corresponds to vdd at your vb uh, v rbl and state one corresponds to ground at this VRBA. What about the write operation? So the write operation also remains similar to the 60 SNAM cell. As far as any SNAM cell is concerned, concerned like whether it be 8T or whether it be 6T, whether it be 13T, the no, basic operations remain the same. And what is there in the write operation? So you first apply VBL and VBL bar of appropriate polarity. So here, as I told, we have different bit lines for write. So we have WBL and WBL bar. So what we do is we kind of apply uh, whatever we want to read in this cell. We'll apply this WBL and WBL bar. Second, we assert word line high. So here, as you can see, that there is this write word line which is special for this. So we'll assert this high, and depending upon you know whatever values are. Like what you, whatever values you give to WBL and WBL bar, this the cell contents should be flipped. Now here, one thing to notice: just because your read and write are decoupled, no sizing constraint is required. So it's not required. However, if you maintain the pull ratio here, you can still uh, do the write operation faster. So that is just to make your write operation faster. However, you can also do away with that. I mean, even if you don't have this pull ratio maintained over here, this cell will work and write will be performed because you're not sizing your this node over here such that this can go, this can't go to VDD. Here, there's no constraint. So this node can also go to VDD, this node can also go to ground. So here, cell ratio, pull ratio are not required. And you know, you can use minimum size transistors, you can use symmetric inverters. So that is a benefit of using 8T cell. What are the disadvantages? So let us look at the disadvantages first. Uh, so let us look at the disadvantages also. So you have one, two, two word lines as compared to your 60, which has got one word line. You have one, two, three. You have three bit lines. You only have two bit lines for your 60 SM cell. You have eight transistors. Here you only have six transistors in your 60 SM cell. Routing of this two word line and three bit line for a single cell, as compared to routing of one bit line and one uh, two word, two bit lines and one word line for this 60 assumption would be very complex. So disadvantage if I tell first complex routing and the inherent disadvantage density. So your density is going to be low. Your routing will be very complex. So. These are the disadvantages that you'll see in your 8 SM cell. 